Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Jackie Carville and I will be both moderating and presenting the webinar today. Before we begin, let me just go over quickly how this webinar will work. You may have noticed that your phone has been muted. However, I do encourage you to ask questions along the way. Simply type your question into the chat dialog at the right side of the screen and select Send to Host. I will be taking questions at the end of the talk today, so chat those in. And I will be also posting the video recording of this webinar later this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So look out for an email from me with a link to that recording. To introduce myself, I am the Marketing Director here at Immunochemistry Technologies. I work very closely with our R&D team to put together our webinars program, helpful blog posts, web content, and keep new products coming out and popping up on our website. So if you have any questions for future webinar topics that you would like to see, feel free to chat those in as well during the presentation. Uh, I always look forward to hearing what particular topics of ours that people are interested in hearing more about. Today's talk will be focused on using different fluorescent detection methods to assess cathepsin activity in whole cells in real time. To give a little bit of background on immunochemistry technologies, we are located in Bloomington, Minnesota, which is a suburb just south of Minneapolis. Immunochemistry Technologies just celebrated its 22nd anniversary in September, so we have been in the immunoassay business for quite some time. ICT was originally founded as a service company, but has evolved since into supplying a variety of products as well. While based in Minnesota, we do have a global network of over 30 distributors to quickly ship products all over the world. If you need information on the best avenue to purchase our products, if you are outside of the U.S., I do encourage you to uh, check with us or to check out our distributors page. So here at ICT, we offer both service projects as well as products. I'll provide some more detail on these offerings shortly, but did want to make a note that all of our products and services are for research use only and not for use in diagnostic procedures. So one product line that I wanted to briefly touch on today is our ELISA solutions. Now these include all the components you need to build a better ELISA. The coating buffers, blockers, sample and assay diluents, Conjugate stabilizers and wash buffer all work together to minimize the buildup of unwanted proteins to generate a very clean signal for your project. These products work together to address common issues you might encounter during your ELISA development, such as specificity, sensitivity, reproducibility, and shelf life. Our ultimate goal here is to help you develop optimized ELISAs that have a high specific signal and low background noise. In addition to the individual reagents, we also sell comprehensive ELISA development kits for both antibody sandwich and antigen down ELISAs. These kits are excellent for novice ELISA users as it provides detailed step-by-step -step instructions for ELISA development. They're also really convenient and economical for people, providing all of the liquid components and template for each um, for developing a novel ELISA at a lower cost than purchasing each of those components individually. So these are just a really great way to get started with ELISAs if you're new in that particular area. So that's all that I'll mention about our ELISA products today, but if you do have questions about the product line, feel free to chat them in and I can get you a response after the webinar. So with our expertise in ELISA development, we do offer a variety of immunoassay-related services for people. Our scientists have years of experience with protein chemistry and ELISA optimization, so we can help you develop reliable, sensitive, and specific immunoassays. We can also scale up and manufacture an assay for internal use for our clients. So if you're in need of a service project, feel free to reach out and get in touch. I'm very happy to facilitate a discussion with our R&D scientists to work through your project. So the product line that we'll focus on for today's presentation is our cell viability assay kits. Our cell viability assays include a large range of fluorescent whole cell assays for intracellular apoptosis detection and cellular analysis. ICT's line of assay kits can detect apoptosis, necrosis, 
intracellular caspase activity, cell-mediated cytotoxicity, activated serine proteases, oxidative stress, mitochondrial membrane permeability, and many, many more options. Uh, these kits are designed for use in whole living cells, so no lysing of the cells is required. Some of you might be longtime users or have heard of our popular Flicka product line for caspase detection, but we do offer so much more in a wide range of fluorescent applications. So today, I'll be giving some background on cysteine cathepsin enzymes and their role in lysosomes and protein degradation, discuss the physiological roles that cathepsins play in a variety of diseases, but with a particular focus on cancer, introduce ICT's magic red assay kits as a method to detect cathepsin activity in real time, and finally, we'll go through a variety of data examples to show Magic Red in action. So to kick off the presentation at the most basic level, let's take a look at the lysosome. This cellular organelle is responsible for digestion within the cell, breaking down all sorts of biological polymers, including proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. To do so, they contain many different hydrolytic enzymes, such as proteases, amylases, lipases, and nucleases. Cysteine cathepsins are highly researched enzymes that are among the lysosomal proteases. Initially synthesized as inactive zymogens, they are post-translationally processed into their active configurations after passing through the endoplasmic reticulum and subsequent incorporation into the acidic environment of the lysosomes. It's these cysteine cathepsins that we'll be looking at for the rest of the presentation today, though it is important to note that members of the serine protease and aspartic protease families also play important roles in cellular activities. So there are 11 different human cysteine cathepsins. The majority of these cathepsins are ubiquitously expressed in human tissues. This expression profile would indicate that these enzymes are involved in normal cellular activities like protein degradation and turnover. There are a few exceptions to this, namely cathepsins K, W, and S. These show some restricted cellular or tissue-specific distribution, indicating that these may have more specific roles in those places. These cysteine cathepsins are optimally active at a slightly acidic pH such as can be found inside the lysosomes. In fact, they are mostly unstable at a neutral pH, and when outside of the lysosomes or extracellularly, they can be rapidly and irreversibly inactivated and structural changes to the cathepsin can occur. So gaining a full understanding of the interactions between cysteine cathepsins and their substrates is the largest challenge in researching these particular enzymes. The cathepsins demonstrate broad specificity, meaning that they cleave their substrates preferentially after basic or hydrophobic residues. This holds true in studies done with both synthetic and protein substrates, thus being consistent with their roles in intracellular protein degradation. So with some backgrounds on how cathepsins function, let's take a look at the structure of the cysteine cathepsins. Now, what you're looking at here is cathepsin L, which is the cathepsin that's typically used to represent the cysteine cathepsins as a whole. We can see that it is made of two domains, the left and the right. And the left domain contains three alpha helices, which you can see there in blue. Uh, the longest of these three helices, known as the central helix, is over 30 residues long. The right domain is a form of a beta barrel with the barrel enclosed by an alpha helix at the bottom. We can see that the two domain interface opens at the top, forming the active site cleft. Within this active site cleft are two reactive site residues, which we can see here in the yellow ball and stick models. A cysteine from the N-terminus of the left central helix and a histidine from the right beta barrel. Together, the two residues form the thiolate and metazoleum ion pair, which is necessary for the cysteine cathepsins to perform their proteolytic activity. Now, cells use a variety of methods to regulate these cysteine cathepsins in order to prevent uncontrolled proteolytic activity, which can be potentially harmful for the cell and surrounding tissues. First, 
the cell can compartmentalize the cathepsins within the lysosomes or other organelles. Second, the activation of the zymogen, or the inactive precursor to the active cathepsin enzyme, is tightly regulated. This activation occurs during the passage of the zymogen through the endoplasmic reticulum, removing a signal peptide so that the enzyme can be properly folded and sent to the lysosomes. pH is another important factor in regulation, as we discussed earlier, uh, with these cathepsins necessitating a slightly acidic environment to maintain structural stability. And finally, small molecule inhibitors such as cystatins, thyropins, and serpins can bind competitively and tightly to the cathepsin active site to prevent their proteolytic activity. So with a better understanding of what cysteine cathepsins are and how they work, let's take a look at some of the physiological roles that they play. While originally thought to only participate in protein degradation, it is now well known that they play important roles in a wide variety of cellular processes. With regards to neurological disorders, studies indicate that a cathepsin K deficiency can lead to changes linked to learning and memory deficits, while other cathepsins have been implicated in Alzheimer's disease. Cysteine cathepsins play a critical role in cardiovascular disease, with cathepsins being differentially expressed in arthrosclerotic lesions as well as being involved in enlarging arteries and the formation of aneurysms. There are also several genetic disorders resulting from mutations in cysteine cathepsin genes, as well as in the genes of their protein inhibitors. In the human cathepsin K gene alone, there are at least 15 different cathepsin mutations that result in a cathepsin K deficiency. Cathepsins L, S, and K have been linked to metabolic syndrome and obesity, Cathepsins B and L have been linked to rheumatoid arthritis, being found in synovial fluids as well as being involved in bone degradation. Additionally, increased cathepsin K activity has been linked to osteopetrosis and postmenopausal osteoporosis. And finally, cysteine cathepsins are upregulated in a wide variety of cancers and play an important role in tumor progression and invasion. As cathepsins could be such a promising target for anti-cancer strategies, we'll delve into the roles of cysteine cathepsins in cancer in further detail. So as you can see in this figure, different cysteine cathepsins are known to be expressed in both tumor cells as well as a wide range of tumor-associated cells. Through a variety of studies, these cathepsins have been linked to neoplastic progression. Multiple mechanisms increase cysteine cathepsin activity in tumors, including amplification of the cathepsin B gene, as well as alternative splicing of cathepsin L and B transcripts. It's not only the huge variety of cancer-related cell types that cathepsins can be found, but cysteine cathepsin activity has implications in a wide range of cancer types as well. Causal roles for cathepsins in cancer have been demonstrated in a variety of ways. In terms of pharmacological and genetic techniques, cathepsin activity has been downregulated through increased expression of inhibitors, as well as administration of small molecule inhibitors in those experiments. Now, while up to this point in the presentation we've talked about cysteine cathepsins intracellularly, I did want to briefly touch on their extracellular localization as well. Now, some believe that the differences in specific physiological functions of cysteine cathepsins, especially when concerning cancer, can be attributed to the differences in cathepsin localization. This extracellular lo location is often correlated with increased expression or activity. As we've discussed, this lends credence to the idea that pH is not the only factor involved in regulating the cathepsin activity. Since we are discussing cathepsins in cancer, I wanted to look at this figure, which examines the mechanisms of cathepsin involvement in cancer progression from an extracellular and an intracellular perspective. Extracellular cathepsins promote tumor progression by initiating a proteolytic cascade. In addition to this cascade, cathepsins are also involved with ECM degradation and remodeling in the tumor microenvironment. 
overall, this increased extracellular cathepsin activity can promote migration and invasion of various cancer cells, as the generally intracellular cathepsins now have access to a variety of new targets related to tumor progression. When we look at the cathepsin's intracellular role in cancer, they are players in programmed cell death, or apoptosis, which is a key component of cancer development and progression. There are multiple pathways it is thought that cathepsins impact cell death. The cysteine cathepsins could engage the mitochondrial pathway of apoptosis after they're released from lysosomes through activating caspases. These caspases would be activated through the bid cleavage and the BCL2 homolog degradation described here in the figure. For a more thorough discussion on caspases specific role in apoptosis, I would encourage you to go ahead and check out some of our other webinar recordings uh, where we do talk about those particular pathways in more detail. But to expand a little bit on the cathepsins and apoptosis, let's take a look at this figure because that's just another way to look at this particular concept. So on the left, there's a look at the evolving role of cathepsins in apoptosis. In situations where the lysosome ruptures, released cathepsins could damage tissue. However, more recent thoughts of cathepsin involvement in apoptosis include a mechanism for indirectly triggering caspases or even possibly taking over some of the roles attributed to caspase activity. On the right, we can look at one such proposed mechanism. Cellular stress or triggering TNF receptors could initiate cathepsin release from the lysosomes. After translocation, they could go on to cleave cytosolic substrates like BID, which would trigger the release of mitochondrial factors and ultimately result in apoptotic cell death. With cathepsins involved in so many different areas of scientific study, including apoptosis, and a clear target for future cancer research, ICT has developed its line of magic red reagents to help study cathepsin activity. The magic red assay kits contain cell permeant fluorescent substrate probes that can be used to quantitate cathepsin activity in cultured cells. Not only are you able to quantitate the cathepsin activity, but you also have the option to monitor cathepsin activity in real time, as we'll discuss in some of the data examples. At this time, we do offer these kits for cathepsins B, K, and L. And all of our magic red kits contain the magic red substrate, hooks to stain nuclei, and acridine orange to identify lysosomes. Our magic red results can be analyzed using a fluorescent microscope or a fluorescent plate reader. These magic red kits offer several key benefits to the user. Uh, first, the kits are very easy to use as you simply culture your cells, add magic red directly to the media, incubate, and analyze. Second, these kits are fast, with reactions typically starting within 15 minutes to watch the fluorescence develop over several hours. The typical incubation time is also only 15 to 20 minutes. The kits are sensitive, allowing you to easily distinguish positive from negative populations. You can conduct whole cell analysis using the Magic Red kits, as our reagents are cell permeant, and you do not need to lyse the cells or undergo any permeabilization steps. And finally, the kits are qualitative, with cellular analysis using the aforementioned methods of fluorescence plate reader or fluorescence microscope. We offer three different reagents, depending on your particular cathepsin of interest. The detection reagents utilize the photostable red fluorophore, Cressel Violet, when bisubstituted via amide linkage to two cathepsin target peptide sequences, the bisubstituted Cressel Violet is non-fluorescent. Following enzymatic cleavage at one or both arginine amide linkage sites, the mono and non-substituted Cressel Violet fluorophores generate red fluorescence when excited at 550 to 590 nanometers. So for the cathepsin B substrate reagent, Cressel Violet is coupled to two copies of the amino acid sequence arginine-arginine, which is the preferential target sequence for cathepsin B. 
Our magic red cathepsin K reagent had cresyl violet coupled to two copies of leucine arginine. And finally, the magic red cathepsin L reagent contains two copies of phenylalanine arginine coupled to the cresyl violet. To get started with magic red, you just simply add the reagent directly to the cell culture media, incubate, and analyze. The magic red reagent easily will penetrate the cell membrane and membranes of the organelles, entering the cell in a non-fluorescent state. If the cathepsin enzymes are active, they will cleave off the two dipeptide cathepsin targeting sequences and allow the cresyl violet fluorophore to become fluorescent upon excitation. The red fluorescent product will stay inside the cell, often aggregating within the lysosomes in other areas of low pH. As the protease activity continues and more magic red substrate is cleaved, the signal will intensify as the red fluorescent product continues to accumulate within the organelles. Here, you can watch the color develop over time and quantify the cathepsin activity. By varying the duration and concentration of exposure to the magic red substrate, you can see the relative abundance and intracellular location of cathepsin enzymatic activity. The positive cells in the sample will fluoresce red and have pronounced red lysosomes and mitochondria. Negative cells will exhibit very low levels of background red fluorescence evenly distributed throughout the cell. The background level of substrate activity could be the result of constitutively synthesized serine proteases that target analogous amino acid sequences for hydrolysis. It's important to keep in mind that there is no interference in this process from procathepsin forms of the enzymes. So ultimately, if the treatment or experimental condition stimulates cathepsin activity, cells containing elevated levels of cathepsin activity will appear brighter red than cells with low levels of cathepsin activity. So when considering your experimental design before you undergo one of your magic red experiments, we highly recommend that two sets of controls be run. A positive control population of cells that was activated to stimulate cathepsin activity, and a placebo population of cells that received just the vehicle used to deliver the stimulated agent. You can create negative controls by culturing an equal volume of non-activated cells for every labeling condition. The negative control and activated positive control populations should contain similar quantities of cells. So if you were labeling with magic red, hooks, and acridine orange, you would create the 10 control populations that are detailed here. Now we'll go ahead and delve into some sample magic red data. So in this particular example, rat fibroblasts were seeded in a 12-well plate and exposed to the experimental treatment the following day. Magic red was added and cells were photographed for 16 hours. So what we can really see here is that the red fluorescence becomes brighter as the enzymatic activity progresses over time. So this is just a really great example of the real-time applications of the magic red reagents. So I wanted to show this image here to illustrate the difference between negative and positive cells. Here, magic red was used with suspension cells that were incubated with a control, which was DMSO at the top, or a stimulant at the bottom for three hours to induce enzymatic activity. And so what we can see is the clear differential between the negative and positive cells in this particular example. So this example shows dual staining with both magic red and hooks. Experimental cells were stained with magic red for 30 minutes, washed twice in PBS, and then stained with hooks for 10 minutes. So you can see here that the positive cells bearing red lysosomal bodies with less intense blue nuclei are mixed with negative cells that have absent or reduced red lysosomal staining and bright blue nuclei. For this particular experiment, the researcher was able to conclude that their treatment was killing the positive cells. And since we've talked a lot about lysosomes today, I did want to briefly touch on the acronine orange stain before we wrap up the presentation. 
So acridine orange can help you with identifying the lysosomes and other organelles. The color of the stain will depend on the excitation or emission filter pairing used. So if we use the stain pairing as magic red, the lysosomes will appear red as seen at the right. Uh, but if used with blue excitation light, the lysosomes will appear yellow-green as seen on the left. So from these data images, you can see that the same set of cells can look different depending on your optical settings. Now, we don't recommend simultaneous or dual labeling of cells with both acridine orange and magic red due to the emission overlap, but you can use the dyes separately in your projects to uh, gather more information just about lysosomes. So as you're planning out your magic red project or working through an experiment, we do have a variety of resources available on our website to help you. You can find webinars such as this one on a wide variety of topics, so just go to our archive on our webinars page. We also have some short product demonstration videos if you would like to see some of our popular kits in action. So I know we definitely do have a magic red product demonstration video up there, so if you'd like to see us actually using those kits. I also periodically update our blog with helpful tips new citations and company announcements, so check there for all your ICT news updates. And finally, we also have extensive documentation in the forms of product manuals, safety data sheets, and certificates of analysis that are very easily accessible from our product pages should you need them. So if you have any issues finding any documentation you need, feel free to reach out to us and we can definitely help you with that. Now, if you're looking for more examples of our Magic Red kits in use or any other ICT products, we do have an extensive list of publications where our products are cited. And as you can see from this publication map, we have thousands of publications from researchers all over the world. If you're looking for specific examples of our products in use, feel free to send me an email and I'd be happy to conduct a publication search for you to highlight a product of interest. And this is a nice picture of our, our team here at ICT. Uh, one of our points of pride here at Immunochemistry Technologies is our excellent customer and technical support. Uh, being a small company, if you have a technical question, you can frequently speak to the inventor of the product to get your questions answered and troubleshoot your project. We also offer fast and affordable shipping, quickly sending our orders out the next day. Our number one priority is really helping our customers achieve success and achieve their research goals. So that concludes my presentation today. I'll now go through and start taking a, a couple questions before wrapping up here to uh, keep it a nice 30-minute webinar. Uh, if you have a question that necessitates a more in-depth technical response or discussion of your project, I will consult with our R&D staff and follow up with you personally right after the webinar. So don't worry if I don't get to your question. Um, you'll definitely get a response from us within the next couple days here. Um, so the first question that I'll take here today, someone is wondering what the difference is between magic red and coumarin dye-based substrates. And uh, so these substrates would be something like AMC or AFC. So in comparison, the Magic Red kits are the only substrate products to use the Cressel Violet dye. And that in contrast to other detection substrates, our Magic Red substrates are membrane permeable and you don't have to lyser permeabilize your cells. So really giving you the capabilities to perform that accurate whole cell analysis in your project. Uh, we have someone else wondering here, um, how soon should the magic red stain samples be read following addition of the substrate? And um, what I would recommend here is that you read your cells after a 30 to 60 minute incubation period, uh, but it is possible to read the signal as early as 10 minutes. So depending on your experiment, you may have different rates of magic red substrate hydrolysis and conversion to the red fluorescent product. So that's something to keep in mind as you uh, prepare your experimental protocol. And I'll just take one more question here um, quickly. Um, someone's wondering what cell density do they need for their project? Um, that's, that's a really great question. Um, what you're going to want to do is culture your cells to a density that's 
optimal for your specific experimental protocol. Um, if you're not sure what that might be, we would be very happy to talk through that with you. Um, what we do recommend, though, is that cell density should not exceed 10 to the 6th cells per milliliter. As cells cultivated in excess of this concentration might begin to naturally enter apoptosis due to nutrient deprivation or the accumulation of cell degradation products in the media. Uh, so that's about all the time we have here today. Again, I see a couple people still chatting in some questions here. Um, I will make sure to follow up with you right after the webinar here um, with answers to those particular questions. Uh, thank you again so much for attending and for your excellent questions today. Um, again, I'll be sending out the webinar recording within the next day or so. And our next webinar is scheduled for the end of November. Uh, that's going to be on the topic of fluorescent reagents in neuroscience research, as we'll just be getting back from the annual neuroscience conference in San Diego. So I encourage you, if you're out in San Diego for the neuroscience conference, to stop by the immunochemistry booth. We're in booth 3104. Um, I'll be there so you can chat with me personally. Um, or, you know, just check back if you're interested in, in that particular area of research uh, for that webinar near the end of November. We'll have the registration information on that webinar up on the website uh, shortly. So if you can think of any other questions after the webinar or have ideas for future webinar topics, please feel free to send me an email or reach us through social media on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and have a wonderful rest.